this episode of China Unscripted, our modern way of life is completely dependent on China not invading Taiwan. We are boned. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Chong. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Chris Miller, Assistant Professor of International History at the Flesher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and author of the new book, Chip War, the Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So before we really get into the, to the meat and potatoes of this, uh, just, just for our audience, like how, why are these semiconductors like so important? Like what's like, they're just computer chips, right? Just can't everyone make those, have those? Well, they, they are just computer chips, but today we rely on computer chips for everything that requires computing, which uh, in these days refers to almost all devices. Anything that has an on off switch with the exception of light bulbs has a computer chip inside of it. And that it's not only your smartphone, it's your computer, but it's also microwaves and dishwashers and automobiles, which will have dozens, if not hundreds of chips inside. So access to chips is crucial and producing the most advanced chips is extraordinarily difficult and expensive, such that only a small number of companies dominate their production. And when you look at the most advanced chips, there's really just a handful of companies uh, that have almost monopolistic positions in the industry. So they're ever more important in our daily lives, crucial for the economy, but also controlled by a limited number of companies in a small number of countries. So there's no such thing as like a mom and pop semiconductor manufacturer making them the way they did a hundred years ago. <laughs> not, not so. There's the, the first chips were actually only invented around 60 years ago. And although uh, there are still a large number of relatively low tech chips in production for simpler uh, solutions, the most advanced chips today have billions of features, each of which is smaller than a coronavirus. Uh, and so the manufacturing of these chips is one of the most complicated processes uh, that humans have ever undertaken. Uh, and it's also one of the most expensive as a result. Well, you just compared semiconductors to coronaviruses. I think we've been demonetized and this episode will be shut down by YouTube. So, well, so you, Chris, you mentioned that they're expensive to make. Like, what are we talking about in terms of the, the cost to build a semiconductor factory for the most advanced kind? If you're looking at the most advanced ships, a, a new facility could cost $20 billion, making mm -hmm. them arguably the most expensive factories in human history. Wow. Like only, only a handful of billionaires could possibly afford that. Only a handful of companies, only a handful of countries can afford it as well, which is why you've had extraordinary concentration in the industry and a lot of power accruing to the firms that are able to do it. What countries are we talking about? When you look at processor chips, the types of chips that uh, run the operating systems in your phone or your computer, uh, Taiwan produces many of uh, the processor chips we rely on and most of the most advanced chips. Around 90% of the most advanced processor chips are made by Taiwan's TSMC, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. If you look at memory chips, there's a lot of concentration in Korea where Samsung and SK Hynix produce around half of all the world's memory chips. But not America? <laughs> well, the U.S. invented uh, computer chips, and there's a lot of U.S. firms that play a really critical role in, in their production, whether the software you use to design chips, the machine tools you use to produce them. But U.S. firms have uh, fallen behind in the actual manufacture of chips. So today, it's basically impossible to produce an advanced chip without using U.S. technology. But most of the production of advanced chips actually takes place in Taiwan, South Korea, or elsewhere offshore. Because I remember, uh, you know, like 10, 15 years ago, Apple switched to using uh, Intel chips. Uh, and those are American, right? Yeah, Intel is a U.S. company, and Intel produces most of its chips uh, in the U.S. or in Europe, although they've just started outsourcing some of their most advanced chips to Taiwan, where TSMC now produces Intel's uh, most advanced chips. Apple actually abandoned Intel chips and now is designing its own chips. In like 2020, they changed it, right? That's right, pretty recently. And now Apple's chips are all, uh, at least all their key processor chips are all produced by TSMC in Taiwan as well. Is that a good idea? <laughs> well, it depends who you ask. 
it's a good idea for Taiwan because they've made an extraordinary business out of uh, producing chips. And TSMC is one of the world's most valuable companies as a result. And Taiwan itself, uh, around a third of Taiwan's exports are computer chips. So it's crucially important for Taiwan's economy. But for the rest of the world, this concentration does introduce risk that I think people are just beginning to realize how reliant we are on one country and one company in Taiwan for our most advanced processors. Uh, with Taiwan having such a valuable chip factory, it almost makes me want to take over Taiwan. <laughs> well, I, I hope you don't do that because any sort of uh, attack on Taiwan would prove hugely disruptive for the, the global tech ecosystem and, and the economy. And I, I think if you want to put it into context, think of the semiconductor shortage uh, the past two years. Um, where we've had hundreds of billions of dollars in delays to auto production and all sorts of other manufacturing. In 2020 and 2021, chip production globally increased both years. There was a, a larger number of chips produced each year. It's just that demand grew even faster than supply. Whereas today, Taiwan produces around one third of the new processor chips we use each year. And so if that were to get knocked offline, we'd face horrific delays, not only to smartphones and PCs, which would be almost impossible to procure, but also autos and aviation and microwaves and dishwashers. It's almost incomprehensible how large the cost would be. Are you saying I might have to like talk to my family or go for a walk outside? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's not just that though. Anything that turns on and off today uh, usually requires a chip. So you know, your dishwasher, uh, you couldn't buy a new dishwasher, microwaves would face horrible delays. Uh, modern life would really grind to a halt. We'd have, we'd have to churn butter by hand the way that we used to do in the 90s. I've churned butter once or twice. <laughs> Rest in peace, Coolio, who inspired Weird Al's version. Oh, I um, was like, what the? <laughs> that was your cure to uh, Hey, so I, you know, you mentioned uh, Taiwan and South Korea, but I know China eagerly wants to build up its own semiconductor industry. Uh, where, where does that stand? How did it start? How advanced is it? Ch China's been building semiconductors now for over half a century, but its industry until recently was really a second tier player. Uh, there was a fair amount of assembly of chips in China, which is a low value part of the process that comes at the end of the semiconductor production um, process. But about a decade ago, Chinese leaders began to realize that uh, China had a fair amount of vulnerability given all the chips it was importing. And today China spends more money importing chips than it spends importing oil. And because of this, Chinese leaders have launched a campaign to try to reduce chip imports by building up China's own industry. And this has made pretty substantial strides by some metrics over the past decade, although China is still very reliant on uh, foreign suppliers for a lot of key semiconductor technology. Now, you said building semiconductors is incredibly expensive. Uh, China probably has the money for it, thanks to all the foreign investments. But is, is this a problem that they can just throw money at and they'll have all the semiconductors they need? Or is there more to it? Well, you know, it's interesting. On, on the, the question of the amount of money that you need, on, on the one hand, China's spending in aggregate uh, probably in the low hundreds of billions of dollars over this decade in its semiconductor industry. It's hard to know an exact figure because uh, spending is happening at the local level, the national level, the provincial level. Uh, but the number's large. Um, but because it's it's not uh, focused uh, in one specific direction, actually for any individual firm, uh, the amount of funds isn't necessarily that, that large. And so there are issues with Chinese firms that uh, can't raise the capital they need. And $20 billion is a lot of capital uh, to raise if you wanted to build an advanced semiconductor production facility. But in addition to that, you need software and you need tools from abroad uh, to manufacture advanced semiconductors. And today, most of those software and tools either come from the US or are subject to US export controls. And so the US is restricting the ability of China to access these tools, and therefore it's impossible to build advanced chips in China today. I mean, can you walk us through briefly like the steps it it takes for like uh, to get a semiconductor chip in a phone? Because like there's there's like all these different pieces that are happening in different parts of the world just so I can have like an iPhone with a with a semiconductor in it or several probably because it's got, you know, a bunch of different chips in it. But like, can you walk us through like one one type of chip? 
Yeah, so if you take an iPhone, it'll have, depending on which model you've got, a, a dozen or so different chips inside. The main processor chip uh, in an iPhone is designed by Apple. Uh, there's a team of chip designers that Apple has hired uh, in Silicon Valley and Israel and Germany and elsewhere that design the chip. And designing chips uh, is a really complicated process. The chip in a new iPhone will have 10 billion transistors on it, uh, tiny electrical switches that turn on and off. And you've got to put each transistor in the right place to get the chip to work optimally. And so you need to access some pretty specific software to do that. And there are three companies that make this software. They're all based in the United States. Once you've designed the chip, you need to produce it. And producing chips is uh, of this nature is done in Taiwan uh, by TSMC, but TSMC itself needs to acquire materials and machines from uh, other companies to do it. In terms of materials, you need ultra pure silicon on which the chip is actually made, plus a bunch of really uh, pure and complicated gases and chemicals, uh, largely from Japan. And then you need machine tools that are able to etch and deposit uh, materials just a couple of atoms thick. Uh, and these tools are, are bought predominantly from the United States, from Japan, or from the Netherlands. And so there's a multinational uh, uh, supply chain that uh, you need to access in order to build these ships. And then once they're fabricated in Taiwan, they're finally sent uh, usually to China and now somewhat to India uh, for putting in an iPhone. Uh, and so the iPhone relies on these ships. They're assembled in China, but really they're made in Taiwan using tools from Japan, the U.S., and the Netherlands. So this sounds like a very globalized process. You know, I think it's, I wouldn't say it's globalized. I'd say it's internationalized, um, but it's not global because a small number of countries control it. And most countries don't have access to the technology and are at the whim of those that do. And actually mapping out who's got control over what tells you a lot about uh, which countries are able to exert power uh, through their control of chip technology. I think you, like, by kind of laying out what happens with uh, the Apple chips, it makes it clearer that even if China wanted to grow its own semiconductor industry, it's going to be pretty tough for them to like, can they actually do everything domestically or would they still have to rely on Japan and Europe and all these other places? If you're looking at advanced technology, I think there's no way in the foreseeable future China can do it all domestically. It's just too expensive, too complicated. Uh, no other country can do it. No other country has really tried. Um, if you're looking at more low-tech chips, there's more of a chance that you can do it domestically. Still probably impossible to do it all domestically, but you can at least reduce your reliance on, um, on foreign suppliers. And in particular, you can reduce your reliance on choke points that are controlled by just one supplier. And that's what China's really focused on right now. And so if you trace the, uh, the dollars that China is spending on its chip industry, a lot of them are actually going towards less technologically advanced chips, where there's more of a chance that China can produce them without being reliant on one supplier, and in particular, uh, a single American supplier that could be uh, used to cut off its access uh, to the technology that it needs. So these low-tech chips are, like maybe you can't use them in cruise missiles, but they're maybe the equivalent of those big bullets in Mario Brothers? <laughs> well, yeah, there's, even in an iPhone, the, the key processor is produced with among the most advanced semiconductor technologies in the world, but a lot of uh, processors uh, in various devices don't require uh, the most advanced uh, um, processing. And so whether it's automobiles or consumer goods, there's a lot of low tech chips we need and we use, um, but that don't require the cutting edge. And so that's where China's investing. And uh, by, by the next decade, it's gonna play a major role in the production of these types of chips. What is the thinking behind investing in some of these lower tech chips? Like, what do they want to get out of it? Well, I think answering that question depends on who you're looking at in China. I think there's people in the chip industry who have business goals. I think there's people in the, the government who often have more political goals in mind. And trying to assess how these different groups interact uh, is, is always difficult. Um, if you look at the Chinese government, there's been a real focus on uh, providing security of supply in case of foreign cutoffs. And that's what the uh, political leadership, I think, is focused on. But a lot of chip executives in China, they're focused on building viable businesses. And they realize that they're not going to be able to uh, 
uh, succeed at making a profitable business if they're taking on existing firms in Taiwan or South Korea that already dominate their markets. And so it's often these firms that are trying to carve out niches with lower end technology where they think they've got a cost advantage or some other market advantage that will give them an edge. And, and this interaction between the political goals and the corporate leadership themselves is what makes uh, China's chip industry uh, so complicated and, and, to be honest, difficult to, uh, to make sense of because you do have so many different inter- uh, actors with so many different goals um, playing a role. Are all of these chip manufacturers being supported with, with funding from the Chinese government? Most of them are, uh, especially when you look at the large publicly traded um, uh, Chinese chip firms. Uh, the Chinese government, both national and provincial level, has invested uh, pretty widely across the Chinese chip industry. Well, the Chinese Communist Party has pretty much given a government mandate to pushing advanced technology with the Made in China 2025 program. Semiconductors are a huge part of that. So what I'm trying to understand is if this, if semiconductors are such, um, you know, they require so many different players and there's no real way to, for China in the near future to just be able to entirely make its own high quality semiconductors. What, why is this a chip war? What's the, what's the threat of any of this? I think there are, are two questions at play. One is there's a, a risk of a real war over Taiwan, which would be potentially intensified um, by the world's reliance on Taiwan for, for chips. So that's that's one aspect of this that is 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 hopefully not, but potentially a, a real war. But in terms of the US-China dynamic, the the Chinese government has correctly realized that they're at risk of the US cutting China off of crucial technologies for the future of the Chinese economy and also of defense systems. And the US is committed to keeping China behind in these computing technologies. And so there's a been an escalating set of restrictions and subsidies and restrictions and subsidies from Beijing and from Washington uh, that are intended to shape the future of uh, which countries uh, industry plays a bigger role in uh, defining the computing technologies of the future. And whether it's Obama, Trump or Biden in the US, there's been pretty consistent policies to keep China back. Uh, And for the last decade from Beijing, we've seen a consistent desire to increase China's footprint in the chip ecosystem with the aim of uh, giving China more uh, more clarity, more security over the semiconductors that it needs for economic purposes, but also for military purposes. Since China is uh, so focused on increasing in semiconductor capacity, I guess, why, why did the United States lose its edge? Well, I think there's two ways to answer that question. The first is to say that the U.S. lost its edge in certain spheres, but not others, which is crucial to understanding the power dynamics here. Um, it, it's certainly the case that Taiwan uh, and its company TSMC is ahead of U.S. firms like Intel in terms of uh, producing, manufacturing the most advanced ships. But we've also got to realize that TSMC is completely dependent on U.S. technology and its production processes. So there's there's, there's interdependence between the U.S. and Taiwan based on what each of them does well. But in terms of why the U.S. fell behind in terms of manufacturing the most ships, it's largely because Intel, which used to be the leader in producing processor chips, fell behind TSMC. Uh, the story of one company uh, really shapes the development of the industry over the last 10 years. And there's a chance that Intel finds a way to catch up to where TSMC is today. It's only a couple of years behind where TSMC is. And under a new CEO at Intel, Pat Gelsinger, they're investing very heavily trying to turn things around. But uh, unless they do so, TSMC will likely remain ahead for the foreseeable future. And so if China were to invade Taiwan, like, what do you think would happen? Would that just disrupt the global supply of semiconductors? Would this then give China the ability to produce the, you know, the highest quality, ninety percent of the market? Would they just blow up? Would the, you know, fleeing Taiwanese forces just blow up the factory so China can't get a hold of it? Yeah, I think it's pretty implausible that China could ever take control of TSMC's facilities in Taiwan. If there was an actual war, you know, we're talking about the most precise machinery uh, in use today. So very little of that would survive uh, a war zone. And even if you got the machinery without any sort of damage, you need all the personnel in place and you need regular 
supplies of materials and uh, software updates and other tools from Japan, the US and elsewhere. So if if there is a war, you'd have to assume that TSMC's facilities stop producing and the impact on the global economy would be dramatic. I think you'd struggle to uh, produce a single smartphone around the world uh, in the year after uh, a attack on Taiwan. Um, a large share of uh, the chips that power PCs are produced in Taiwan. Uh, data centers are crucially dependent on chips made in Taiwan. You basically can't have a cell phone tower without chips made in Taiwan. Uh, the the number of industries that would face wrenching delays is extraordinary. I think it's, it's quite plausible that an attack on Taiwan, just due to the semiconductor uh, industry disruptions alone, would have more of an economic cost for the global economy than all of the disruptions of COVID, uh, certainly in the trillions of dollars. Well, wow. and, and these disruptions would not only happen here in the US, they'd also be equally disruptive of China, right? That's right, that's right. Um, China is, is in some ways even more dependent on TSMC uh, than the United States. It's not just that Chinese consumers uh, want smartphones and PCs, but also that a lot of the uh, goods into which TSMC's processors go are actually assembled uh, in China. For example, iPhones are uh, largely, but not exclusively, assembled in China. And so all of those uh, assembly uh, facilities and jobs would be at risk. And I believe Huawei is one of TSMC's biggest customers, correct? It used to be one of TSMC's biggest customers uh, until U.S. sanctions on it in 2020. Wait, so now Huawei can't buy any TSMC chips? It needs a special license from the U.S. Commerce Department to do so. Uh, and so the the key product that Huawei used to produce at TSMC, which was the, uh, the processor in each Huawei smartphone, uh, is now de facto off limits. Uh, and so Huawei is no longer an important customer to TSMC. How does the, the U.S. Commerce Department control what a Taiwanese company can sell to a Chinese company? Yeah, that's a, a, a key question. So uh, the under the Trump administration, the U.S. tried to ramp up controls on Huawei by solely restricting the sale of U.S. produced goods to Huawei. Um, but that didn't really work because Huawei could turn to South Korean firms or Taiwanese firms uh, to get around those restrictions. And so then they changed uh, U.S. export control rules uh, by introducing what's called the foreign direct product rule. And what that means is that any good abroad produced with U.S. technology is therefore subject to export controls. And so TSMC's facilities are full of U.S. technology, the types of machine tools I mentioned that can only be produced in the United States. And so TSMC has no choice but to impose U.S. export control rules on any company in the world because if it doesn't do that, it's in violation of U.S. law. And if it violates U.S. law, it can't get the tools that it needs. So because it's basically impossible to make a chip anywhere in the world, at least an advanced chip without U.S. tools and software, the entire world's semiconductor facilities have to apply U.S. export control law regardless of where they're based, even facilities in China. Interesting. What, so, so what is... Huawei doing now that it can't get chips from TSMC or I guess any, I mean, there's Samsung, but that's basically it. Yeah. And Samsung is subject to the same rules. Right. So like, what is, what is poor Huawei to do? Well, it's a, it's been a real problem for Huawei. They've had to divest a number of business lines. They've divested their smartphone business line, uh, their cloud computing business line. They're trying to uh, rejig their technology. So it, operates with less advanced ships, uh, working with uh, some Chinese producers who are able to produce for them. But the reality is the company is now a, a shadow of its former self because of these U.S. restrictions. So it sounds like the Trump administration saw Chinese acquisition of semiconductors as a threat to national security. Was that uh, a departure from previous administrations? You know, it was to an extent, but I think there's really a lot of continuity between where the Obama administration was heading, uh, where the Trump administration ended up, and where the Biden administration has continued policies. Um, from 2014, um, when Xi Jinping made a number of uh, key policy statements on semiconductors from the uh, initiation of the Made in China 2025 policy that we mentioned earlier, uh, and as a result of the ongoing Chinese military buildup, which has really narrowed the gap in military terms, between the US and China, there's been kind of growing concern over the past decade in the US, um, both about uh, Chinese advances in general, but about semiconductors in particular. And in the Defense Department in the US, there's a, 
a strong belief that semiconductors are crucial to the future of military power, whether it's autonomous drones or advanced electronic warfare systems, processing power, memory capacity, um, signals processing, all of which depend crucially on semiconductors are also going to be fundamental to the future of warfare. And so as China was narrowing the gap technologically with the United States and dramatically increasing its role in the global chip industry, there was a lot of concern in the U.S., regardless of administration, that this was also going to bleed into an increased Chinese military capacity in the future. So has the U.S. kind of slowed slowed down China's military progress by putting these uh, restrictions on ultimately chips from TSMC and Samsung? I think the honest answer to that question is that it's hard to measure right now. Um, we'll probably know in a decade's time what the effect has been. But if in terms of actual hard data to answer that question, we don't have that much. You can certainly find people who will give you a, 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 a strong view based on their uh, ideological priors, but it's, it's a really difficult question to measure. Yeah, that's what we want from you, just just pure speculation based on your <laughs> pre-existing biases. <laughs> uh, I was actually wondering about U.S. companies doing business in China, because how much were U.S. companies involved in helping build the China semiconductor industry? They, they were very involved, um, in part because U.S. companies are involved in inevitably in building any country's semiconductor technology. Um, the, the nature of the U.S. role in the chip industry is that you really can't build a chip industry without a fair amount of, of U.S. involvement. And so in a lot of the key Chinese companies like SMIC, which is the biggest um, Chinese uh, manufacturer of semiconductors, uh, U.S. Uh, firms and uh, former employees of U.S. firms were really crucial in uh, the early stages. I think over the last decade, that's begun to shift both as U.S. firms have gotten more skeptical about their ability to make money um, in uh, in partnerships with Chinese firms, uh, and because the political signals and the regulatory risk have gotten a lot more concerning. Um, and so we've had uh, a partial bifurcation uh, beginning in the industry, whereas in the past, there was really a lot of back and forth between U.S. and Taiwanese and Japanese and Chinese firms. Now there's a lot more um, skepticism about interaction because of the regulatory risks involved on the U.S. side and because uh, there's growing uh, uh, worry or concern that it's very difficult for foreign firms to make money in China given the government's uh, focus on promoting domestic champions. Can you, uh, can you talk a little bit about how joint ventures and technology transfer played a part in this? Yeah, here, here too, I think... You, you need to look at specific joint ventures to, to know what happened in any given situation because there's a whole lot of variety um, as to how they worked. One European semiconductor executive that I, I spoke with told me that whenever he heard a Chinese partner say, let's make a joint venture, he heard, uh, let's find a way to lose money together um, because uh, he believed they were never profitable at all for uh, either party. Um, other joint ventures have been uh, quite profitable for uh, foreign firms because they've involved local governments or provincial governments providing huge subsidies uh, to uh, foreign chip firms to set up facilities uh, in in their locality or province. So there's a lot of um, a lot of variability based on which uh, specific joint venture we're talking about. But one of the key themes in uh, in the reassessment of joint ventures from a political perspective in, among Japanese leaders, U.S. leaders, Taiwanese leaders is the uh, concern about forced technology transfer, uh, whereby Chinese partners would start a joint venture and then the Chinese government would come in and try to push um, uh, the, the foreign firm to transfer technology uh, to the, the Chinese partner. And this is uh, something that has been a growing worry among the foreign investors in China, which is one of the reasons why we've seen a, a pretty marked slowdown, almost a complete halt really, uh, in large scale foreign investment in the Chinese semiconductor industry. Well, how much of China's semiconductor industry do you think was built by IP theft? You know, I think IP theft alone um, is is not the crucial driver. There is some IP theft. There are a couple of uh, high profile examples of it, um, but much more difficult to police than IP theft is 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 forced technology transfer, which is not about IP, but about know how uh, and expertise. Uh, and the concern in, in a number of cases is that 
uh, China's government was getting involved in uh, ways that stepped outside normal business pra practices to push foreign firms to transfer uh, this, uh, this knowledge that they otherwise wouldn't have wanted to transfer. It's clearly been part of what's driven uh, China's uh, growth. I don't know that it's been the most important factor um, at all. And I think there's plenty of reasons to have expected that even if the Chinese government wasn't involved um, in its chip industry, China would still have had a growing um, footprint just because of how involved it is in the electronics industry uh, in general. But we've certainly seen a number of very high profile examples of, of uh, uh, attempted or successful uh, forced technology transfer over the past couple of years, which has really changed the uh, tenor of the debate, both in the foreign chip industry and also among foreign governments. Well, how does that play out exactly? Like, like the Chinese government is telling the the foreign firm that's doing a joint venture in China, like you know what you 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 have to show our Chinese managers how to run the machines, like that sort of thing. Th that's certainly one way it can happen. Um, uh, there's a, a big question as to um, who actually operates systems when there's a, a facility in China. Is it Chinese versus foreign workers? Um, and we've seen a number of examples in the past where foreign firms set up a facility in China, but it's foreign workers who are actually doing the hard jobs, uh, which is a deliberate strategy to keep the expertise in-house and not let it spread. And so if you do have more of a localization of the workforce, you also have more localization of the expertise um, as a result. And the Chinese government has sort of understandably in some ways been pushing for more localization of expertise. Uh, in some ways using legitimate means, in some ways using uh, illegitimate means. We've had numerous examples, for example, of bogus court cases, for example, being brought against firms that weren't doing enough localization to um, uh, to appease the, the local government in, uh, in, in a number of cases. Right. And there's also one of the things you mentioned in the book is uh, Chinese firms hiring like Americans and other foreigners to come work for the Chinese companies and bring their expertise. That's right. That's right. I, I think there's 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 some uncertainty as to how great of a strategy that actually is. Um, we know that Chinese firms pay quite high salaries to recruit Taiwanese or South Korean or Japanese uh, or American executives to their firms. Uh, how much technology transfer actually transfers uh, is not always that certain. And there are a number of uh, pretty high profile cases where a Chinese firm paid a lot of money to bring a uh, chip executive in from abroad and then uh, ended up failing a couple of years later, suggesting that that's far from a silver bullet for uh, for technology transfer. Well, there's one kind of hilarious example. I think it was Grace Semiconductors that was established that by uh, leader Jiang Zemin's son and some uh, Taiwanese guy. And then they hired George W. Bush's brother, Neil Bush, as a consultant for $400,000 a year. And I'm sure, you know, Neil had a lot of expertise in semiconductors. No doubt. <laughs> no doubt. And and I think that the more you dig into the the Chinese chip industry, especially in its, its more uh, in recent years where the government's played a bigger role, the more you find political connections like that being more important. And it makes sense because today uh, accessing government subsidies and getting the government on your side in terms of pushing your products is really important uh, for selling things to the Chinese market. Whereas in the past, if you were a Chinese firm, you were focused primarily on exports. So you had to have good products at low prices. Today, it's a different commercial dynamic in China. Uh, and that incentivizes a lot more focus on the politics rather than on the technology. So the US government is obviously taking steps to restrict or control China's access. What about the Taiwanese government? I mean, surely they must be concerned. China openly threatens to invade Taiwan. That's right. That's right. You know, the Taiwanese are in an interesting position. Um, on the one hand, it's a very rational strategy for the Taiwanese to, uh, to some extent, hide behind the United States and let the United States uh, take the steps that will anger the Chinese the most. And I think some of what we see from Taiwan is that dynamic playing out. Um, so Taiwan is able to sort of say we had no choice in the matter. We're just being restricted by the U.S. export controls, even if there's some support in Taiwan for these measures. On the other hand, uh, Taiwan is deeply, deeply exposed uh, economically to the uh, Chinese electronics industry in general. And so uh, measures to restrict trade uh, between Taiwan and China are very costly to Taiwan. And so Taiwan is split between, on the one hand, the real security needs that you mentioned, and on the other hand, the reality that a third of their exports are chips, and most of those chips are going to China. 
Well, I think that what you've been saying is very interesting because a lot of what I hear is, you know, one of the reasons China might try to invade Taiwan is to get access to its semiconductor industry. But from what you said, most likely that kind of invasion would completely disrupt the semiconductor industry, which would have a devastating effect on China. Plus, the U.S. would probably restrict even more of the the the, the, in, the ingredients of these things that China needs. So it almost seems like in some way that the, an invasion of Taiwan would just be more devastating than to China than than anything else. Instead of a slow buildup. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think the question is whether Chinese leaders realize that. Uh, or are focused on the economic consequences. We've seen a, a couple of instances in recent months of um, uh, of researchers affiliated with the Chinese government advocating moving on Taiwan, um, suggesting they might not really understand how the supply chains work. And I think we shouldn't be surprised uh, uh, if top Chinese government officials aren't experts in the semiconductor supply chain, because I think <laughs> many government officials worldwide are not. So I. I think the logic you sketched out is accurate, whether government officials in China understand enough about the, the granularity in the semiconductor supply chain to uh, arrive at that logic, I'm not sure. And I guess I look at, for example, in Germany and Russia, at the start of this year, Germany was betting on energy independence uh, to guarantee peace, and Russia was betting on energy independence to guarantee it leverage vis-a-vis -vis Germany, and, and that bet didn't work out. Uh, the pipelines between those two countries are now destroyed. And so I do worry a little bit that economic and technological interdependence might not be as powerful as we think, especially if leaders on one or both sides of the straits don't really understand uh, how complex the technological supply chains actually are. Do you think leaders in other countries understand what is happening with Taiwan and TSMC and the complexity of that? You know, I think in aggregate, the level of knowledge about semiconductors in government in most countries is quite low. Um, it hasn't been a big issue for most countries for a very long time. It's a really complicated industry um, that politicians generally don't need to become experts in as they rise up in their political careers. Taiwan is an exception. Korea is an exception. But if you look at most other governments, uh, the things that make successful politicians are things very different from expertise and chips. And although the level of expertise, I think, has risen a lot in the past couple of years because of the shortages and because of growing discussion about the, the Taiwan question, I still think in aggregate, our political leaders have a lot to learn uh, about the semiconductor industry. So let's say an invasion does happen and the semiconductor uh, supply chain is completely disrupted. What could the U.S. do to recover from that? I think the short answer is not much. Um, building a new chip industry uh, or building a new chip facility takes years, several years. And the machines that you need to put in uh, these facilities uh, also take several years to build. The companies, the five companies that I mentioned uh, that build these machines already have their order books full uh, out through next year at least. Uh, and so our ability to ramp up capacity uh, to replace Taiwan is really not there. And it's not that Taiwan's a small player. Taiwan produces one third of the processor chips we rely on. Uh, so there's no easy way we could uh, deal with the issue. I think we'd be rationing chips uh, for a very long time in the future, uh, which means a lot fewer smartphones, a lot fewer, fewer computers, a lot fewer dishwashers, uh, and a lot less economic growth as a result. The, the cost would almost certainly be in the trillions regardless of what government did. I mean, I'm just thinking about at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, when there was a severe mask shortage. And even for that one much more technologically simple thing, um, it took many, many months uh, for... To, to make something as simple as a mask. To get that manufacturing in the U.S. where it had been mostly in China. So it's, yeah, I'm thinking about chips now. It's kind of mind-blowing. Well, since so much is made uh, globally, couldn't the rest of the world kind of hodgepodge something together? Or internationally? Yeah, maybe? internationally, yeah. Well, again, the question is 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 how and how fastly. The, the reality is that uh, no country has spare capacity right now. Um, and the, the number of companies that are capable of producing the machinery you need is very small. Um, so there's, there's no stockpile of chips waiting to be used. There's no stockpile of machinery waiting to be used. We're completely unprepared. Uh, if such a war happens uh, and the results would be economically disastrous. And that's that's part of the reason that I wrote Chip War is that 
I started realizing how exposed economically we all are uh, and how almost no one had really thought through the consequences. Well, I'm guessing semiconductors are not like uh, oil or seeds. It's not really something that you can just like stockpile a bunch of them, right? You can't have like a vault somewhere with Scrooge McDuck swimming around in a pile of chips. It's, it's hard to do because the technology in chips advances every single year. And because of Moore's law, chips every year become exponentially more powerful. And so if you've got a stockpile of 10-year-old chips, you know, that can operate a early generation iPhone. Um, but you know, that, that, that won't get you very far today. Yeah. I mean, you know, imagine using an iPhone that's a couple years old. Like that's, that's crazy. You got, <laughs> you got to get the new one. <laughs> But, you know, it's we can joke about that, but you think uh, using an old iPhone with a new operating system and you feel it slowing down right now. Imagine if we had to operate our entire tech ecosystem on several years old chips. Uh, things just wouldn't function. I'm imagining the world, but at the way that Cuba has had to, like, rejigger, like, 1950s cars oh, for decades, yeah. but us with chips. Oh, that's and- a kind of a cool cyberpunk, steampunk <laughs> future. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, imagine we go back to those big tabletop monitors that are like, you know, like deep, like a TV, like an old TV. Uh, <laughs> but, but those are your iPhones. I mean, you could, you could just downgrade the operating system, right? If Apple was like, okay, we're not going to make a new iPhone next year. Let's not, let's not make this iPhone require uh, more processing with the new upgrade. Because like they do that now, right? I mean, they, they make the operating systems more complicated. And one of the results, intended or not, is that old iPhones just don't work well anymore. So you have to get a new phone. And Apple could change how they do that. Yeah, I think that's right. We could all revert to 10 years ago in terms of our software and our hardware. The problem is uh, that doing so would also uh, erase 10 years of economic growth in the process. Um, because most of the advances we've benefited from over the past decade have been driven by semiconductors. Um, you know, it's not just the devices that chips make possible. It's improvements in corporate productivity come from applying artificial intelligence to manufacturing processes or applying AI to make better farming uh, outcomes. And all of this is about chips. Uh, and so if we don't have access to better chips and the number of chips we need, data center growth slows down, our ability to uh, improve productivity declines, and the economy grinds to a halt. That's the danger. If only we hadn't gotten rid of all those mom and pop semiconductor chips. (laughs) (laughs) Well, okay. So you you mentioned artificial intelligence, Chris, and uh, I want to just ask about this because I have this idea that the future of warfare uh, is going to be a lot about artificial intelligence whether it's like in guided missile technology or like things I can't imagine, like maybe kind of like a RoboCop scenario, but I... <laughs> okay. He was a policeman, not a military. Yeah, I, I know, but like just, you know, what, what was the what was the big scary one that shot about, that shot everyone? The, I, the, I forget. You know what I'm talking about. It's like, 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 okay, so you've got this artificial intelligence that's being used for different types of military uh, design and warfare. How is that related to the most advanced chips? And uh, what are we going to start to see in terms of AI now that China is being uh, largely cut off from the, the TSMC advanced chips? So first off, if you think of what you need for AI to work, to kind of simplify, you need good algorithms, you need good data to train the algorithms on, and you need a lot of processing power, memory power, uh, to actually operate this. And I think it's pretty clear that China's got good algorithms and smart programmers that can write good algorithms. It's got plenty of data, although uh, you want to ask what specific types of data do you need for specific use cases, but everyone's got data. Uh, it's it's processing power, memory power that is controlled by a small number of countries and China's not one of them. And so that that is the, uh, the risk to China's um, rollout of AI across its economy and uh, and its military in particular. Um, and if you think of use cases for AI in, in military systems, there's a number of uh, different places it's it's already being used and will be used more in the future. You know, already you see it used in things like predictive maintenance, um, which I guess you'd expect. But going forward, uh, as we get more and more autonomous systems, uh, they will be making more and more decisions 
on their own and doing so will require memory uh, so that they are able to uh, store lots of data on them. It'll require more processing power so they can think uh, more rapidly and more effectively. And it'll require a lot of signals processing as well. Uh, taking in, for example, a lot of visual data, infrared data, uh, data from LIDAR and sonar, and all that requires chips too. Whenever you convert a real world signal like light or sound into data, you need a chip to do that. So if you imagine a, an advanced drone today, it needs to remember a lot of stuff. It needs to make decisions uh, that are complicated and do so quickly. And it's got dozens of sensors on it. And that's a lot of semiconductors uh, on a drone. And just to give you an example of, of the numbers, a an anti-tank missile of the type, uh, a shoulder launched version of the type the US is giving to Ukraine right now uh, called the Javelin, which was uh, first pioneered several decades ago, has 200 semiconductors inside. And this is a missile that is uh, is is simple, it's decades old, um, and it doesn't have a whole lot of complexity to it. It just finds a tank and hits it. If you're talking about drones that can take off on their own, fly on their own, identify targets on their own, uh, think on their own, that's a whole lot more computing power and sensing power that they need, which is a whole lot more complicated semiconductors. Uh, and that's why both in the US and in China, uh, military officials believe that chips hold the key to the future of military power um, because that sensing, that thinking, uh, that autonomous decision is going to be crucial for many types of military systems. Anything in space will require more advanced semiconductors. I mean, if only there were a way to train humans to fly aircraft. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but the aircraft they're flying is still going to need... Yeah. A lot of semi. Well, unless right. you go back to World no, War II. Yeah, people aren't like plotting on maps where they are and stuff like right. that anymore. Uh, I mean, the bomber planes in World War II would have engineers. You'd have a pilot in the front and engineers in the back who would be calculating the, the wind speed and the altitude uh, and time the bomb drops like by hand, right? I mean, now like you just like that would be so far behind, like it would be almost useless. Well, what I'm getting from chip war is just how fragile the semiconductor supply chain is already. And if anything, moving forward, it will only become will only become more dependent on this incredibly fragile system that can easily be disrupted. I think that's right. That's the, the, the great promise, but also the great risk of semiconductors. On the one hand, we rely ever more on them. On the other hand, uh, our reliance makes us vulnerable to disruption. And, and that's... That's why I, I wrote Chipor when I realized both the importance of chips, which I had sort of taken for granted, and the extent to which their production was so fragile, as you say, so controlled by a tiny number of firms. Well, so what do you think is the solution to this? Because if anything has become clear over the past year is that we are not in a world where you know, all the countries can work together with shared economic development. You know, there are still authoritarian regimes that will invade a country and just cause a lot of grief. Uh, where, where does this go? I, I think that's right. And that, that is the, the core geopolitical tension hanging over the chip industry, which was built over the past 30 years on the assumption that a globalized economy was, was here to stay and is now dealing with this bifurcation that you mentioned. You know, anyone looking at the entire world's reliance on Taiwan-produced ships, I think, comes to the conclusion that the security of Taiwan is crucially important. Even if you don't care about Taiwan for its own sake, uh, you ought to care about it for the semiconductors that it produces and that you rely on. Uh, and I think that comes through pretty clearly by just a short glance at the uh, at the at the the graphs of who produces which chip. If you've ever used an iPhone, uh, you've benefited from Taiwanese chip making, uh, and that's something that no one else is going to uh, replace anytime soon. And I think next to that. If you look at the steps that governments like the US, Europe, Japan are taking to try to diversify the footprint of uh, where chips are made a little bit, uh, those are the right steps to be taking. They're not going to dramatically reduce our reliance on Taiwan, but any sort of reduction, I think, uh, is, is a smart move given just how concentrated chip making is in Taiwan and how dependent we, are, we all are on uh, TSMC. What do you think about the CHIPS Act? So the, the key provision of the CHIPS Act is going to be to uh, provide financial incentives for companies to build more advanced chip making facilities in the U.S. Uh, and that applies both to U.S. companies like Intel, but also 
to foreign companies like Samsung or TSMC uh, is actually working on our new facility in Arizona, which will make some uh, fairly advanced chips when it's online uh, either next year or the year after. And I think this type of legislation makes sense. It's expensive. $50 billion is a lot of money to spend, uh, but it's not a lot of money to spend when you think about the cost of what could go wrong in Taiwan. Now, that's a trillion dollar cost, if not several trillion dollars. And in comparison to that, the several billion we're spending on, on chips seems like a reasonable investment to me. And do you think that the U.S. is going to continue to be fairly aggressive when it comes to um, trying to limit China's chip making, chip making abilities. I was kind of surprised when you said exactly what um, the Trump administration had done with Huawei. I didn't realize it had become, um, like I didn't realize the amount of leverage the US really had in that sense. And do you think they're going to keep doing that? Yeah, I think there is a, a bipartisan consensus in the US that this policy is basically right. There's some debate around the margins, but the fact that it's was started under Trump and continued under Biden, I think shows you that it's it's fairly durable. Uh, and my sense is that in, unless there's a big change in China's own ambitions and the money that China's putting uh, into its own chip industry uh, via uh, programs like Made in China 2025, unless that changes, I don't think the U.S. policy is likely to change anytime soon either. Yeah, this is this is all just in- incredible. Like the the devastation this will have to the way of life that we know if the supply chain is broken, but also just like the entire future of humanity is dependent on the development of these semiconductors and these technology. AI, you know, everything involving space travel will be dependent on the continued advancement of semiconductors. A lot is at risk. And yeah, a lot is at risk in terms of like very one small country. Yeah. In under the crosshairs of a very evil authoritarian regime. Yeah. So basically, uh, Chris, we're all terrified now. So well, thank I, you I for think, that. I think we ought to be terrified. <laughs> <laughs> when I started, when I started this book five years ago, it was before the semiconductor shortages. Um, before I really understood how important chips were, I thought it was just an interesting topic, cool technology, uh, fascinating stories of businesses rising and falling. And I realized that this is the central risk that we all face, that modern society can't function without these ships and they're produced on an island that is the center of geopolitical competition today. Um, you know, that's why I called the book Chip War. It's, it's I don't think, an overestimation uh, to say that this really is the central challenge or conflict of the modern day. And whether it is a war that stays cold or turns hot uh, is the question on which the fate of, of not only advanced technology, but our economy and our society uh, will turn. So in your expert opinion, should we be learning to use spears, learn how to create a fire? <laughs> um, you know, Liver King says eat raw liver. If you can learn to make chips at home, you'll be certainly far in advance uh, in, in case Taiwan is attacked. Comes back to the mom and pop semiconductors. <laughs> I knew it. Well, before we wrap up, I do want to talk about uh, the case of the Fujian Jianghua. Uh, that, that, that's, that's pretty interesting, I thought. I think that's we? an interesting example of the U.S. flexing that uh, power, the leverage. So Fujian Jianghua was a, a Chinese company that was trying to break into the memory chip business, and in particular the DRAM memory chip business, which is uh, – dominated basically by three companies today, one American and two South Korean. Uh, and the American firm Micron had a facility in Taiwan, uh, and it's, uh, several of its employees there uh, took some proprietary information and uh, transferred it to Fujian Jinhua, which is a company in, uh, in China's Fujian province. Um, and TS, uh, and uh, Micron uh, sued for um, uh, infringements of intellectual property, uh, and a court in Fujian uh, uh, granted a, a countersuit against Micron um, for violating intellectual property laws that were actually stolen from it, uh, and issued a, a really uh, wide-ranging injunction that really threatened Micron's business uh, in China unless it gave up its intellectual property lawsuit. So it was a, a clear example of a, a bogus court case being used against a foreign company uh, to try to extract some technology. And it, it posed the question to the U.S. government of how do you respond? Do you complain? Do you act in some way? 
and uh, this was under the Trump administration, they decided to cut off Fujian Xinhua from accessing U.S. tools. Uh, and what that meant was that the company basically went out of business immediately because it couldn't access any of the tools it needed to produce chips. So it had had some of the IP, had some of this uh, proprietary information, but without U.S. tools, it didn't matter. And so the company quickly um, quickly went bust a, as a result. And this was one of the first examples of uh, the power of U.S. export controls in this uh, sector uh, being uh, used as an example. Before this, no one had really put together just how powerful these controls were, but the fact the U.S. could essentially turn off a Chinese chip-making facility uh, overnight uh, was a real shock to the entire uh, semiconductor world, but also, I think, a shock to the Chinese government, who hadn't really realized how vulnerable they were uh, and how vulnerable their reliance on U.S. tools made them. That is incredible. It's, it's like a rare example of the U.S. government actually getting involved and fighting back using a similar way of handling it that like the Chinese Communist Party has been doing for decades, which is the Chinese Communist Party works with companies to push its agenda uh, and will use, for example, the court system in the case of Micron and Fujian Jianhua. Like the Communist Party controlled court system makes a ruling to help a specific business, right? And they just do that all the time, like with... Um, Xiaomi that sued Apple for infringing on its phones, even though Xiaomi was the knockoff Apple. Like, like you've seen this all the time. And now, and then it actually changed when the US government was like, you know what, we're going to do something. So that's like a hopeful note that like, actually there's something the government can do. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I, on the one hand, I think you're right that it, it, it is a, a more effective response. On the other hand, it's a shift away from, a reliance on rules to govern the U.S.-China trading relationship. For a time, there was a hope that you could have trade rules that everyone would follow, and that this would be an effective way of, of governing U.S.-China trade as well as everyone's trade. And, and now that hope is really dissipated, and the U.S. and China are both using not rules, but executive decisions to uh, enforce uh, trade decisions. And on the one hand, I think that's more effective in shutting down uh, some of uh, China's more extreme uh, violations of, of what would ought to be private business decisions. On the other hand, uh, it does suggest that there's not much scope for normalization of U.S.-China trade going forward if, in fact, we're just counting on uh, the U.S. president to intervene and cut off Chinese firms um, somewhat on on a whim. Uh, that's not, not a great basis for a stable economic relationship, even if it is more effective in the short run. Yeah, I mean, it's a, that's a good point. And I, I think, you know, I would say that ever since China joined the WTO, two decades ago, like there was, there was this idea that China would follow the trade norms and the, the international rules, but they were violating WTO rules basically from day one. And so there just wasn't a lot of response to China's rule breaking. And then if like, ha, I guess, I don't, I don't know how to deal with it. If one side just continually breaks the rules, I guess you got to kick them out of the club, but th that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, I think that's that's the dilemma is that right now everyone is every country is still in the WTO, even though no one believes the WTO's rules can address the problems that we've identified. And there's no solution in place right now. So everyone's stuck in this uncomfortable reality where everyone's relying on the same trading system that everyone also thinks is pretty subpar, but there's just no better solution. And so the, the chip industry itself is really uh, suffering from this because it's deeply reliant on US, China and China, Taiwan trade, hoping to find some sort of stable rules. And in reality, it's at the whim of, of the chip war as, as US and Chinese officials make decisions that aren't really bound by rules that are bound by political calculus uh, as both countries jockey for power in their, uh, in their relationship. Is there anything that the semiconductor companies can do You know, I think right now they're trying to uh, to understand where governments are going and realizing that unlike most of the past 30 years, they're now at the whim of uh, political authorities, both in Beijing and uh, in Washington and, and elsewhere. The reality is that governments are offering so much money and also threatening so much of their business with new regulations that chip CEOs for the first time in a long time uh, really feel like they're no longer the driver's seats and are trying to figure out what political leaders are going to do first. I think what really needs to happen, Chris, is for 
Xi Jinping to read Chip War and just understand that he needs to back off from Taiwan? Well, I, I will have a, a, a Chinese language translation coming, but it'll be published in Taiwan in, in traditional characters. So I'm not sure if he's going to be a reader. Well, not until he takes Taiwan. And at that point, it's too late, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. It's, it's, it's a great book. I also want to thank all of these semiconductors that have made this interview possible and for uh, the semiconductors that make it possible for people to watch it on their own devices. It's going to suck when we don't have those anymore. Our entire business model is dependent on semiconductors. Well, and, you know, uh, I'm learning how to use a spear. Mm. Well, well, thanks so much for having me. I'll go train with, with my own spear as well after we sign off. <laughs> Great. That's that's all I want from this show is to, to encourage people <laughs> to prepare. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. thanks for having me. Well, I got to say, this left me feeling pretty depressed. In the Cold War, there was the fear of nu- you know, being nuked back to the Stone Age. Mm-hmm. In our day, it's just, oh, a supply chain collapsed, and now we're back in the, the Stone Age. The, the, the fear of not having an iPhone 15 is my greatest fear, Chris. That's right. I'm kind of imagining some kind of, now that you said Stone Age, Flintstones kind of future where we have to try to replicate modern technology we have cars without we have to pedal it without semiconductors <laughs> well you, right. it would actually you know like the steampunk era is a kind of non semiconductor high tech future right you know steampunk is not real right it will be uh, it will yeah that's my point yeah. i don't think we have to actually uh, you know rely on steam because there will still be internal combustion engines but yeah, but they're less cool, Shelley. So I would go back to steam. <laughs> it's it's far less efficient, but the steam comes out and that looks cool. There is a, a series of books that I read that the author called them card punch. Um, punk? Punk, because it was kind of like early computing uh, back in the 1950s where you were uh, literally feeding like ca- cards. Punch, punch cards. Punch yeah. cards, yeah. Or punch card punch, maybe then it was. Punch card punk. punk. Yeah. I, I, I like that. We're... Did your book have calculators, like, as a job title? Maybe, because it was actually about, um, like, an asteroid hits the Earth in the early 1950s, and it speeds up the space program so that people can go to the moon and then Mars because the Earth is going to go extinct. So everyone's going to die except for, like, a couple hundred people that get sent to Mars. I Something like that. Okay, and that's that's... That's positive. Well, I'm not concerned about the semiconductors. I don't need a dishwasher. I can wash a dish myself. And are you going to drive a car? We've got cars out. The, the, they'll last. Uh-huh. Uh, Actually, I don't, I don't know. If you have a like the car, the kind of cars that you have now with so much technology in them, I don't know if they're going to be as easily repairable as 1950s Cadillacs or whatever. Yeah, right? like you know, if you buy a new car today, you know, like the the drive shaft, like your steering wheel is not connected to your drive shaft. It's all electronic. So that like the steering wheel has nothing to do with actually physically moving the wheels. It's just connected via electronic signal. But older cars, like you can turn the wheel when it's in park, right? And it'll move the wheels because it's a physical connection. And they stopped doing that because, oh, electronics are so cheap and easy to use and it's more efficient. And it's safer. And, it, and it's safer because, you know, if you want to have like lane assist where it keeps you in your lane with like newer cars. Well, I mean, even the power steering was supposed to be safer, right? Yeah. Um, but like, you know, like, or like, okay, so so my brother has a uh, like a classic car from the late 70s and uh, like all of that's manual. So it's actually really cool. Although technically it does have some chips in it, but they're just super low tech. So we're um, all going to be driving... 1970s Volvos is what you're saying? Yes. Oh my gosh, it's the worst future imaginable. <laughs> Volvo punk. Well, vo- <laughs> vo- Volvos actually used to be really cool uh, until Volvos were bought by Greeley and then the uh, Geely. Geely, Geely, the Chinese company, and then the um, the quality went of uh, Volvos went way down. Uh, hard to imagine why a, a Chinese takeover would reduce the quality, but it's hard that's to imagine happened. Volvos being cool. That's what I'm still going. My first car. Oh no! <laughs> was a it was like a 1992 silver Volvo station wagon. Wasn't there a while where like Volvo bug 
Oh no, that's Volkswagen. Never mind. Nope, Volvos. Mm-hmm. Nope. People's wagon. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so that was a that was a very cool. So car. your first car was a station wagon. <laughs> yes, yes, it was Shelley. All right. I mean, my first car was a minivan, so I can't. So, so you and I equally had the same number well, of friends, Well, it wasn't really was my zero. car. It was just the car that my parents let me drive. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that was my case, too. You know what my first vehicle was? <laughs> what? Mahayana Buddhism. It was a great vehicle. <laughs> that is... Wow, that is a very obscure joke. <laughs> yeah. That's not going to make sense to anybody. Every, come on, everyone learns about that in school. Mahayana Buddhism? A little bit. It's like it's a major world religion. Uh, look, my school didn't get past like World War One. Yeah, there was Mahayana no Buddhism, Buddhism until happened after. Before. <laughs> but it also didn't go back further than like, what, 1492 The Stamp Act or of 1776. Yeah, exactly. So most of it was concentrated between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Those were good years. Yeah. Yeah, back when we were winning wars. Well, I suppose we depends on who you are, right? I mean, if you're the British, <laughs> you didn't win. I mean, uh, where I feel like we're going to get comments from people about how they burned the White House in 1812 and they won. I don't think they won. Did they take over America? No. No, but that's like saying China won World War II because the – which the Chinese Communist Party does like to claim. That's but, silly. They didn't burn down the White House. <laughs> You know what I'm saying. It's not It's not that the U.S. War, won the War of 1812. It's that Napoleon kind of distracted the British. Whatever, Shelley. I don't like that take. Is that what they taught you in school? No, I don't think I really learned anything about Napoleon because that was Europe. I don't think I learned anything in, in school, to be honest. I learned about my Mahayana Buddhism. Yeah, I don't know what school you in, went in to. In your Catholic yes. school? Wow, that's a very progressive Catholic school. Yes. Yeah. They they actively pitched other religions. Yeah, they had a section. There was one project where we had to go to like a church or service of another religion. And you picked Mahayana Buddhism? No, I didn't. I picked uh, Unitarianism or something. Wow. That's silly. They, well, I'm not going to tell that story. That could get us in trouble. Uh, <laughs> yes. We, um, uh, but, but back to um, chip wars. To, to microchip. Uh, semiconductors. Steampunk. Oh. I oh, wonder if I wonder if someday we'd be like semiconductor punk. You know what I mean? Like, but aren't when, we living in semiconductor we, punk? When, yes, when the future has progressed to like liquid crystal tech. I don't know, like whatever. Like the, the next, go old technology. Yes, <laughs> crystal <laughs> technology. <Just> crystals. <laughs> crystal technology, and then we'll look back and be like, oh, remember semiconductors? <laughs> well, no, that's not going to happen because soon we will be supply chained into the Stone Age, and people will talk about this as like and legendary we'll but crystals. Times. But crystals are types of stones, so we could advance using a purely crystal-based technology. Think about it. I won't. I won't. I think this is a good place to end. (laughs) Thank you for joining us on this episode of China Unscripted. I hope you take from this just how fragile and crystalline the world is. It could change at a moment's notice. So start learning how to use a spear now. It's not like hug your loved ones. It's learn how to use a spear. Your loved ones might be full of semiconductors. Think about it. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Jung. And I'm Matt Ganesta. Talk to you next time.